today. Our scripture reading this morning is going to be uh, from Psalm 56. And just a little bit of introduction to the Psalms. Uh, Our series for the summer starting next week will be Awake My Soul, and it's just some selected Psalms in the 150 that we have in the scriptures. And so when I thought about this for the series, I thought about the reality that over my journey, uh, the Psalms have been one of the things that have awakened my soul. And I realized uh, at some point on my journey as an adult that my soul had been, I don't know if muted is the right word, but uh, suppressed uh, through my first 20 years of uh, formation as a human being and that it was a different picture than what God had for what life is like. And one of the key things that has, and still is, awakening my soul is spending time in the Psalms. And we're going to talk about that uh, throughout this summer, uh, starting next week with Psalm 1. One of my favorites from the Psalms, you know, I'll just mention something else that has awakened my soul. Right over here. (laughs) Having grandkids, especially grandsons, what I found in a surprising way that I wasn't anticipating was that when I was with them and they were at a certain age, it would bring me, uh, it would bring memories of my childhood back to me and I would come up with an alternative path that could have been followed or I could have journeyed through that would have been uh, better, more alivening, more nourishing to my soul than the one I experienced. And it gave me a picture of God that was different than the one that I had. Because I imagined that all I wanted was the best for these boys and for my involvement to be with them in such a way that it brought joy to their life. And I'm thinking... God's at least, that's a minimum thing that God would be interested in, you know, (laughs) and so much more. So it it helped me picture, I would say, an interested and loving and involved God that was a little bit of a different picture than than what I'd had uh, growing up. So um, a bunch of the Psalms, I think about 40% of them are individual laments. And one way we can awaken our soul is like, it's okay to pour out this kind of stuff to God. And notice as I read through Psalm 56, uh, the way the psalmist, David, uh, like pours out his heart to God. To the choir master, according to the dove on far off terebinths, a tune that we don't know what it is. (laughs) But there was a tune, and that's like the name of the the tune that they would sing this psalm to. A miktam of David when the Philistines seized him in Gath. Won't go into that story, but he's running from Saul and basically had to go to the enemies of the Israelites and get safety from Saul. And then they were a little threatened by him, so he had to fake like he was uh, unstable of mind in order to save his life. And so here's his prayer in that situation. Be gracious to me, O God, for man has trampled on me, for man tramples on me. All day long, an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long. Now, the reality is, every day of his life, this isn't true. But in his current situation, this is what he's so aware of and what it feels like is his reality is that every day of my life, someone's out to get me. Many attack me proudly. So what do I do? When I'm afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh or man do to me? All day long, they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife, they lurk, they watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For, they, for their crime, will they escape? Question to God. 
Here's what I'd like. In wrath, cast down the peoples, O God, the ones that are my enemies. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. So imagine a God who every tear that we shed, he's fully tuned into and aware of, such that you could say he's got a collection of them in a bottle tied to us. Are they not in your book? Another image of keeping track of our stories. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? And then he just makes a promise that he's assuming his prayer has been answered. I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. And he's saying this in anticipation of the answer to his prayer, not in the history of it having already happened. You have delivered my soul from death, yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. As we again remember our Lord and his love for us and his desire for relationship with us, and we use the means that he prescribed, which is we take a piece of bread and we remember what he, his body that was broken for us. We take a cup and remember his blood that was shed for us. And in that context, we remember how much he loves us and how much he wants to have relationship with us and how much he's involved with us as we journey. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that again we have to remember you and to connect our souls with yours in the reality of the way you want us to picture you and picture your love for us and your vital and interpersonal involvement with us. As we take these elements again this day in remembrance of you, I just pray that our hearts would be renewed and restored uh, to uh, a fuller picture of uh, your love. And I pray that if there's anything now that is a barrier between us, something we have not admitted to you as true, that we, right now we could confess those things. We could agree with you about those things and have you cleanse us from all unrighteousness and co come to this table again, pure and clean before you. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Feel free to, to take communion at either station when you're ready.
each week we give you the opportunity to worship the Lord uh, by sharing. And one of the things we share is our prayer requests, and we pray for each other. And so I invite you, if, uh, if you have a prayer request you would like us to remember uh, together as a community today, that you can just uh, raise your hand or shout it out, and I will uh, put it in the prayer that we'll have this morning. So does anyone have a prayer request? Christina. Well, continue for rain. More rain for this is kind of an answer and a continued request because we have not gotten enough yet. And a little uh, sub point to this prayer request, but not during the time that we're on the parade. <laughs> so like rain now, pause, and then rain again. <laughs> That's our specific request. But it was nice seeing a little bit of rain coming down. I was thinking about Joe having to bring the fire engine to our location with no roof overhead. So thank you, Joe, for for doing that in the rain. So we'll continue to pray for that. Anybody else? Okay, join me. Uh, I will I will just share one that I'll be praying about. My friend, Roy, a high school buddy from 1968-69, Sunshine Bible Academy. Uh, we've been friends ever since then. And uh, as you know, his wife recently has been diagnosed with... Uh, uh, terminal uterine cancer. Uh, basically, as they did surgery, they found it was completely encompassing her whole internal area. They couldn't even see her organs, they said, when they opened her up. And they took out as much as they could, and they had to take out her colon, which was blocked by the tumor. So she now has a colostomy bag. I don't know if you know anything about that, but I talked to uh, Roy yesterday, and he goes, this is where the rubber of marriage meets the road when you start <laughs> being the, the person responsible to at least do it or help your wife uh, change her colostomy bag. But even in the midst of that, he, had a, a, he and she both have a heart of, of, I guess you could say, peace and joy in the midst of this very difficult time, uh, trusting God to to carry them through, perhaps bring them some extended life beyond what they were given as far as the timeline, um, but not angry in the sense of, why are you doing this, God? This is terrible. And even if we had anger, we could still say it, and God would understand. And that's another thing about having grandsons that's helped me. Like, you know, they can be where they are in the moment, and my uh, love and desire for them doesn't change, and I imagine that same thing to be true of God. So let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this day, and we do thank you for the rain that has fallen, and we know the ground is, is needing much more than what we've already received. It would be our desire and request that we'd have a little reprieve during the time that we're on the parade route. Um, and that people would still be able to come out and enjoy this time, and that we would have an opportunity to connect with some people as we walk along the route and hand out some things. So after that, Lord, we would love for there to be a, a significant downpour and a watering of the land. Uh, many farmers and gardeners are in need of this, and it's just one of the things that reminds us again that you you are the one that we must uh, seek and call out for, that we can't control the weather, the rain, and many other things in our lives that uh, sometimes we think we are more in control than we are. I think of some past requests that we've had uh, that we continue to pray for, including uh, my friends uh, Roy and Kathy and their journey with cancer, uh, Pam and Gary also on that kind of a journey, and we just pray for their strength, for their peace, for them to be drawn closer to you through the suffering that you have allowed to be a part of their stories. And help us, Lord, as we journey to, uh, as David pictures for us, to be able to cast our cares upon you with a full and deep confidence that you know exactly what it is that we are experiencing the pain of it and the, the tears of it often, 
and yet you you are faithful and good and want us to cry out to you and trust you for the path that is best for us as we move through life. I think of those, Lord, who have just uh, challenges and issues with uh, mental health things, uh, things that we prayed about in the past, and we just pray that your hand would be close beside them, they would sense your presence with them, and there would be a, an opening of the, the eyes and the heart and the sense of, of your involvement with them, and even, you could say, healing in the midst of that situation. Lord, for other requests that would be present in a room this size, uh, we, we would offer those to you this day, and I thank you for my brother Chris and his family who are with us today as he comes. We just pray that you'd give him a freedom and a sense of, of just uh, pouring out to us from you what you have given to him this day. And we pray these things, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. As we mention every week, we have small groups that meet, uh, a woman's group on Tuesday mornings, uh, three men's groups. The next Wednesday night meeting is this week, and a prayer group on Thursday night. If you want to know anything more about any of those, just uh, contact myself or Christina and we'll direct you uh, to the way to get connected. Uh, today, as you uh, realize probably when you drove up and saw an antique fire engine in the parking lot, it's Parade Sunday and we have a group of people who will be walking or riding on that, walking with or riding on that fire truck and handing out some pieces of candy but also some some truth uh, from God's word about how to have a relationship with him. So we just would pray for everyone on that parade route, including these three guys over here. So, and also just note in your calendar, the second Sunday in August is our outdoor worship and picnic. And that is at Seabold's Pond again, and it starts at 10 a.m. So just note that if anyone has never uh, been baptized as a believer, has never identified with Christ through believer's baptism, just let me know and we can schedule that for that Sunday. And as I mentioned, my series starting uh, this coming Sunday is Awake My Soul. I call it Psalms for Sunday, Summer, Psalms for Summer, Volume 1. So we're going to just pick some selected Psalms uh, over the, the Sundays in the summer and go over those and, and embrace uh, the reality of a heart awake to God and who he is and who he can be to us. So does anyone have a story that they would like to share this morning as part of our worship gathering? Everyone's caught up, I guess, to their sharing. So, we have with us today uh, Chris, and he's going to come up after the break and share God's Word with us. Amanda, and I wish I could remember the four kids' names, but there they are right there. <laughs> it's so good to have you with us today. Uh, thanks for making the journey along with Chris. And just so you know, for uh, the summer, there's going to be two other times, uh, July 9th and August 20th. Uh, Chris will be sharing with us, too, so you can look forward to those days. So why don't you uh, look around, greet someone you haven't had a chance to greet, introduce yourself to someone you don't know, and we'll gather back in the next uh, two or three minutes.
up and I feel so big. I am. Uh, my wife would say I'm tall, dark, and handsome. Yes. Right, love? Yes. Um, so good to be with each one of you this morning. Um, first and foremost, wanted just to honor where honors do. I deeply appreciate um, your pastor and Jeannie for um, their love and support. And uh, if you didn't know, um, as much as I do love being with each one of you every time I get to come up and speak, I get the privilege of just getting to sit and talk with Pastor Nathan. Um, if not once a month, every other month, um, he makes time, meets me at Great Lakes, some coffee spot, and just really um, makes safe space for me just to share my life in ministry and um, just gives me such encouragement and so uh, I just want to say thank you Pastor Nathan and Jeannie and if we can just give honor where honor's due to your servants and pastors at Hope Community Church especially your elders as well I deeply appreciate your leadership here at Hope Community Church well I've been given the privilege oh and also my beautiful wife is um, here and my children so I love you and uh Thank you for taking the trip with me. Um, I love that you guys are going into a series called Awake My Soul. And the reason is, um, I feel like this is a great pro prologue to your series. Because um, I would love to talk to you about what it looks like to be like Moses and go and be with God in a tent of meeting and understanding what it means to have a relationship with a God, especially when you can't see him. And so I'm just very encouraged that where you're going, I get to come in and just talk about a little bit of how that awakening of your soul can already start to begin um, before Pastor Nathan comes and just does an incredible job. So um, I get it, it's a great privilege to be following the Spirit of the Lord in this house. Um, as you guys journey this summer of awakening your soul to God. And so if you have a Bible, and I hope that you do, if you can just turn to Exodus 33. The verses are up there, and I would just say also, we could start at 7 if you have your Bible, and not 9, just to give a little bit more context for everyone. And we will read from Exodus 33, verse 7 to 10. And then we'll drop down, oh wait, yep, to 10, and then go down to 12 through 13. Exodus 33, starting at verse 7 to 10, and then verses 12 through 13. The word of the Lord. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people will rise up, and each will stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people will rise up and worship each at his tent door. Verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. 
I would love to take the time that I have with you and speak from the topic, the cloud of the unknown. The cloud of the unknown. A couple of weeks ago, I was given the privilege to go to a church that I admire from afar in Portland, Oregon. Um, it was for a pastor's gathering. And the focus of the gathering was the ministry. It was about how pastors could be equipped when it comes to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in a post-Christian context. From the beginning to end, it was a powerful experience of what life can look like when you connect your life to the Spirit of God and learn how to listen to the voice of God. In his first session, they had an incredible speaker that I think some of you may be um, familiar with. His name is Dr. Tim Mackey, and he is the co-founder of The Bible Project. Has anyone heard of The Bible Project, an animated video series you can learn all about the Bible and various themes of the Bible. Um, it's really good. If you haven't, I helped you out. Check it out. The Bible Project. Um, and the co-founder was um, Dr. Tim Mackey, and he was the first speaker of this conference. And he was speaking on his personal renewal with God, if, if anything, how he, in his season of life, had awakened his soul, even him. Um, and he was there to share it and how it related to the Spirit of God. As he sat down in front of 500 pastors, with me included, um, he presented kindly and quietly these words. He just sat there and said, uh, I don't know what I'm supposed to be talking about. Now you have to understand, I flew spirit and united <laughs> to get to <laughs> Um, Portland, Oregon, and ready to learn about what it means to hear the voice of God and connect to the Spirit of God and talk to hear from people like talk to Dr. Tim Mackey. And he sits there that morning and says, I don't know what to talk about. <laughs> and after a few moments and awkward laughs in the crowd, Dr. Tim Mackey just smiled and he opened up his hands and he said, Come, Holy Spirit. And as is silent as it is now, it was silent in that sanctuary of 500 plus pastors. And I came to realize as we read our scripture this morning, he was asking for the cloud to come. Dr. Tim Mackey didn't know what he was supposed to share, and due to this very recent personal experience that he had and how he was going to share it that morning when it comes to the Spirit of God, he had learned that the best thing to do in moments of unknowing is invite God into the situation to let the cloud come to his tent. How many times in moments of knowing do you pause? and allow the cloud of God to come toward you. Dr. Tim would end his time of complete silence that was feeling this sanctuary and quietly said, I think I know what I'm supposed to share about now. And what he shared was two personal encounters with God, and I would love to just share with you one of those. The first encounter was after meeting with a spiritual director um, the spiritual director invited uh, Dr. Tim Mackey to start praying for things to God. Now for Dr. Tim Mackey and what I've come to learn for other people in their relationship with God, that this can be tough as it was tough for Dr. Tim Mackey. I've come to realize that it's hard for others to get along with God because of fear, because of shame, or as someone has told me, it's just that they don't know God like. This was the case for even Tim Mackey. And so he began this approach through the prayers of his children instead. As they were getting ready for bed, he will start asking them in their prayer time how it's going with God answering them in their prayers that involved their time on the playground with their friends. 
And they and he started to see God answering the prayers of his children while they're on the playground. Their little feuds, their own little situations, and how at night they will pray about them, and then they'll come back at night with their dad and tell him, hey, yep, this started happening, and this started happening. And he started through his children seeing how God was having his relationship with them. And this all will culminate in a worship service while he was there with his kids, and his kids are worshiping around him. And he began to feel a tingling on the top of his head. And then a clear as day whisper in the spirit that said to Tim, you're not a failure. And at this moment of his testimony, as you can see, this is literally from my phone. So I just quickly took a picture. So that's my view at that moment as well. This gentle and kind spirited man fell from his stool and started to cry because just the simple fact that he came to realize God was speaking to him was overwhelming for him. And after getting himself together, he would say a few profound statements that I felt resonates with especially my generation in this cultural moment when it comes to people who are distant from God and, and have questions of relating to God. He said statements that I thought would just resonated at this cultural moment when it comes to having a knowledge of God and actually knowing God. Dr. Tim Mackey, if you didn't know even more information about him, he has founded this, um, this resource called the Bible Project, which creatively showcases um, the Bible as a unifying story that leads to Jesus. But not only that, he has a PhD in Semitic languages and in biblical studies. He wrote his dissertation on the manuscript of the history of the book of Ezekiel. That sounds too much for me. Um, with a focus on the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Pastor Nathan, I would pass. I just, that's a lot. Um, he was a professor at Western Seminary and served as a teaching pastor for many years of a, a, ch a church in Portland called Dorf Hope. This, this particular person said, that they had this lack of spiritual engagement with God. He said things like this when he was sharing, that he had an underdeveloped soul. He had an impoverished imagination. And he realized even him was deeply secularized. But the kicker was the statement about his spiritual life prior to his spiritual director and it was just seen here as we see the photo. He said these words, I didn't know how to have a relationship with an invisible person. This guy said that. All that Bible knowledge, loves the Bible, contributes it to the body of Christ, said he didn't know how to have a relationship with an invisible person. Have you ever felt the same? You've read the Bible all your life for years, and yet you feel like it's a beginner when it comes to having a relationship with this invisible person we call our God. To talk to God and to actually hear his voice in return. It seems like in the past, we have been able to manage without needing to answer that question in American Christianity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Bible has been so sufficient and helpful for many, many years in America. But now we have this generation that I, that I am very much acquainted with that is rising and emerging and is putting more authority on experience than arguments. A generation more about a statement like, show me, instead of convince me. So when it comes to God for this generation, especially if we have a passion and a heart to win their souls, our souls then must experience God on its own. In the cloud. Not inside the camp. Brian Zahn um, um, a, a known writer and theologian, specifically when it comes to the theme of this zeitgeist of this cult in our cultural moment as Christians, especially my generation, called deconstruction. 
He wrote a book saying, when everything is on fire, faith forged from the fire. And if you don't know, the term deconstruction is more of people that have had faith in God and then lost it and struggling to find it back again. Or for those who are just very far from God living in this post-Christian culture. He said these words, The tsunami of secularism scoring Western Europe and North America will not abate anytime soon. This spiritual crisis will not be survived by clever apologetics or by waging misguided cultural wars or by pining away for an intrievable past. If the Christian faith is to survive this tsunami of secularism, it will be because Christians have their own experience with God. Their own burning bush, I would say. Their own Mount Sinai of 40 days and 40 nights. Their own Mount Horeb of the times of Elijah, of hearing that quiet whisper of God's voice. To camp out for connection with the cloud of glory. Or as your new series will be, to awaken your soul. But for so many of us, and me included, especially in my history and time with God, when I see that cloud, it's not a cloud of glory, it's not even a cloud that I'm familiar with, it is a cloud of unknowing. Moses met with God face to face as we read our scripture this morning within a cloud that was a visible and is a visible symbolic expression of God's empowering personal presence and would settle at the opening of what the scripture calls a tent of meeting. This is not the big tabernacle that they will build up in the wilderness, and definitely this is not the temple that will be established. This was just a tent, a tent. I'm going camping next week. It is a tent. That's it. And the mighty, powerful presence of the cloud of God will come to you. The cloud is where Moses develops his relationship with God's spirit and God's voice. The Israelites would then experience God through the relationship Moses had with him in the cloud. So hear this. This is what is, what is really implying here. The Israelites' experience with God was only in connection with Moses' own experience with God. You take out Moses' experience with God and the Israelites' have none. My point is, watching others following God doesn't make you any closer to God. Churches all across America, even us, we will go to church, and you can come to church, and we have a man of God, or a, man, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a clergy, or a man of faith speaking, and you'll think, oh, I go every Sunday. But we would be, we will learn that even if I come every Sunday, my relationship with God is not to be based upon the, the man of God's experience with God, but my own experience with God. As we heard in the scriptures, when Moses would go and camp out, they wouldn't go camp out also to the tent. They would watch that man of God. But as we've come to learn and what we heard about this generation, they're waiting to see all of us go to that tent. They want to see us have an experience with God. The Israelites' experience with God was only in connection with Moses' own experience with him. As much as it can be all inspiring as it was for the Israelites to see this huge cloud over this tent and see Moses walking toward it as all inspired as it would have been. It isn't as inspiring. If it's not inspiring them and if it's not inspiring us to go pitch our own tent with God, honestly, it's a waste of time. If it doesn't I'll just invigorate us, inspire us to say, you know what, let me go get my tent and I'm coming for you, God. If it doesn't inspire us to do that, as it all aspired as it was, and definitely back then to see that as a front row seat of God's movement in that cloud, it's not what God intended. He wants us there too. 
we could find ourselves just like Dr. Tim Mackey with an underdeveloped soul. Proclaiming the name of Jesus because we know the scriptures and listen to Christian radio, but our soul is just as underdeveloped as our secular co-workers and our neighbors, in which we can find ourselves just like the Israelites, finding ourselves not having a spirituality of our own, but living off some spiritual leader's relationship with God instead. Rich Velotis, um, the new pastor of a church called New Fellowship, which used to be the church that Pete Scazzaro's church was, who's written a couple books. Well, the new pastor, Rich Velotis, had said this in a conference recently. He said, what our next generation needs is people who have been with God. The world more than ever needs us to have our own experience with God, to know God, not just to have knowledge of him. They don't need our knowledge. Matter of fact, they don't even want to hear it. And here, I love books on prayer. I love books about God, but I'm coming to learn that I need to put them down, go into my own closet, shut the door behind me, and get with God. I love a good podcast with theology sprinkled with a little cultural relevancy, but the more I'm coming to realize it's not going to win the world for Christ in this generation. I can get all this knowledge and accumulate it, but guess what? They don't want to hear it. They want to see me. They want to see and feel God through me which will mean I'm going to have to need to allow God through me. So how does this happen? By going through the cloud of unknowing and coming to know God's spirit and God's voice. And so for the little short period of time left, that's all I would like to do is break down a small theology of God's spirit and God's voice that we see symbolically expressed in the cloud and end with a cool illustration from a movie I really like. Sounds good? Sounds good. Let's first start with God's spirit and a little theology. And if you have a Bible, I will have you turn to the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1, and we'll just read verses 1 through 2. God's spirit. It says this in Genesis 1, verses 1 through 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. In Genesis 1, 2 specifically, we find the Spirit of God hovering. In the Hebrew, in the original language, they, they would say incubating over creation. And if you hear incubating, you can think like of a mother hen sitting on her eggs, incubating and hatching them. Another way to understand this term incubate can mean practically to contain something for the development for it to come to life. Now, you need to know two things about this when it comes to the Spirit of God and the chaos of creation when it comes to incubation. All right, hang on with me. I'm going to nerd out on the Bible a little bit. Here we go. First one, creation, as we see it in in Genesis 1 through 2, is within a three-dimensional realm bound by time and space. Creation, where we're in right now. We're in creation. We're bound by time and space. And the Scriptures are saying that the Spirit of God was hovering over this. Now, the Spirit of God is not bound by our three-dimensional creation of time and space. It's beyond time and space. Hang in with me. When we see the Spirit of God hovering or incubating over creation, it means God's Spirit is over time and space. In other words, the Spirit of God incubates over the past, the present, and the future. Containing the past, containing our present, containing our future. You mean he was there and yeah, he was with me then. You tell me he's with me now? Yeah, he's right here, right now. You tell me he's going to be with me? Yeah, he's going to be there. He's already there. 
incubating, hovering over time and space. Containing the past, containing the present, containing the future for its development and to make darkness and chaos into beautiful, created life. Can I get an amen? amen? The Spirit of God was over all creation then and it's over all creation right now, hovering over us and beyond us like a mother hen always covering and caring and creating the fearful, fearfully and wonderful creations under it. Second, so first one, the Spirit of God is hovering above creation like a mother bird, like a hen. Second, creation is visible. I can see you can see me. But the Spirit is invisible. The word spirit there in Genesis means ruach. Can you say ruach? Then go to seminary. All right. <laughs> Which means breath or wind. In other words, it's saying the breath of God or the wind of God. In other words, the spirit of God is the breath of God or the wind of God. So can you see your breath? No. Can you see the wind? No. What this tells us, if we put them together in this moment, Genesis 1 through 2, is that the invisible, personal, presence of God was incubating over the visible darkness of chaos of creation. So the reason why you can't see the Spirit of God is because one, it is beyond us, but second, it's invisible. But it doesn't mean God's not there. And yet, it hovers over our past, our present, and our future as a hen hovers over his babies of love and warmth with the power to develop you and I and to bring new life even out of our darkness and our chaos. Sounds too good to be true? Psalm 139, verses 7 through 16, says everything that I'm saying. Because some could say, that sounds too good to get true, or no way, Chris. Well, let's scripture prove scripture. In Psalm 139, starting at verse 7, it says this. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, you are there. Meaning, even in my future, when I'm in heaven, you're going to be there. Even if I find myself down in hell. You're going to be there. So he's there in the future. No matter your final destination. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be the night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day for darkness is a light with you. Even when you find yourself in the darkest moments of your life, God says, I'm there. And it's not darkness to me. It's as the brightest of the day can be. I see you. For you formed me in my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. No, I was an accident. I was supposed to be here. My mom, my dad made sure of to tell me every day. No, no, no. God knew you were coming. Before time, your time started, he knew. He's the one who knitted you to come. Hovering and creating new life. He was creating you. I praise you for I'm, um, sorry. Uh, wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in the book were written, every one of them. The days that were formed for me when as yet they were none of them. How does he know my past, present, and future before I even became a person? My time even began because he loved. And he knows he's beyond our time. He knows everything about your story. And so even here, 
in Psalm 139, 7 through 16, what it tells me is this. We can't escape the Spirit of God. He is hovering and He is covering our lives. If that isn't enough, Listen to this in Deuteronomy 32, 11, which brings us back in our opening text of, of Moses in the tent in this cloud. And it helps us to think, what is this cloud all about? Check this out in Deuteronomy 32, 32 verse 11. It says this, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that flutters over, or the Hebrew word hover, same as Genesis 1, 2, it's called rakat that flutters over, hovers over, incubates over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, and bearing them on its pinions. That's what it says in Deuteronomy. What was God doing in the wilderness with that cloud following the people everywhere? It was an eagle that was fluttering, hovering, covering them. And how do we see God hovering over them in the Exodus story? A cloud. Exodus 13, 21 says this, And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. So what is happening in Exodus when we see God in a cloud? We are witnessing an invisible being within a cloud, hovering over his people, generating new life and protecting his creation. What's the new life, Chris? They were slaves. He was making them into a new people, the people of God. And how was he protecting them? Bread by day, fire from a rock, hovering around them. And for me, I can remember like it was yesterday when this transcendent being of love we call the Spirit of God that overcomes time and space hovered over my life of darkness and chaos. I remember I was in college. I was, I was, God was pulling me into a relationship with him. Um, I had no history of church, but I was in college and Something was happening. I was reading the Bible. I was talking to my teammates. I played college football about Jesus. And they were like, stop talking about it. I didn't know what was going on with me. And I was still living into a very secular life. I was, I was literally going to someone's house, you know, this particular kind of first place house that you get particular things from. And I was, my friend was asking me to go get some for him. And I was done for like a month of that because God was like changing me, but I was still knowing where this place was and I was going to go get it for him. It was a festival in our, in our um, block in the city of Detroit called Dally in the Alley. And I'm in Cass Corridor and I'm like, yeah, I'll go. And as I'm walking to that house to get that particular thing, no one's on this block. And I hear someone just like, say my name. And it was like something like right on the back of my neck. And I turned around. Like, what? And when I turned around, I saw a police car following my every footstep. And that's when I realized I'm not going to that house. <laughs> you see, someone was hovering around me. Someone was covering me trying to protect me to make sure I will continue to generate life even in the midst of my darkness and chaos. Kind of get an amen. It wasn't just that this transcendent being of love that we call the Spirit of God overcoming time and space on that corner that day, making his presence felt as a feeling of wind hitting my back. But the motivation behind was to protect me from ruining my life. I thank the Spirit of God to be compared to a hen and an eagle hovering over space and time, even a cloud, because I have experienced what that does. It protected me. It delivered me. And you might say, from what? Myself. 
protected me, delivered me from me. That's the Spirit of God. God's voice. If we continued in Genesis, we would just have to go one more verse in Genesis 3, in verse 1, which says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. In Genesis 1 3, we find the Spirit of God speaking into the darkness and chaos to form light, then day, then night, then sky, then sea, then land, then creatures under, creatures aground, and creatures above. And then created you and me by the voice of Himself. As much as the Spirit of God breaks through our time and space to hover on us and over us, not much sooner. Does the voice of God in the story of creation, does he speak creation into life? Now, what is the motivation, you would say, of this transcendent being of love that we've been talking about called God? Well, call that we call the Spirit of God that protectively hovers over its creation to communicate across dimension. Why would this Spirit of God, this transcendent being of love, why would it cross across dimensions to communicate to us. Why? Very simple. To have a personal relationship with you. To connect with you. Do all that, just that, just for that? Yep. To connect with you. You know why I know that? Because I just can read the next chapter. That's what we see in Genesis 2. God's intention of creating paradise was so that he can just walk in the cool of day with you and I. All of that, all the animals, all the degrees, the vegetation, the sky, the land, he did all that for what? Just to walk with you and talk with you. So don't ever believe that God doesn't want to talk to measly little me. He created this whole world just for This is also what we see in Exodus 33, because we know that there was a fall that happened in the garden. And so God, all the way from Genesis back to Exodus, you see his heart has not changed. He wants to walk and talk with his people, but now he has to do it from a cloud. And so what does he do? He comes in power in the cloud, and he's just waiting and seeing, will we come to him? And we see Moses taking that step into that cloud. And we see in also in Numbers 11, 25, an understanding of what the cloud was to Moses. In Exodus 11, verse 25, it says, Then the Lord come, came down in the cloud and spoke to him. So there it is, God's voice. When we see the cloud, God speaks. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And as soon as the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, meaning they spoke on the behalf of God. In Numbers 11, verse 29, just four verses ahead, it says, this is Moses' heart to his people at that time. He says with unction, would that all of Lord's people, all of God's people, would be prophets, that the Lord will put his Spirit on them. He's saying, what I have come to experience personally, of intimately being acquainted with him. I wish everyone could experience this. To really experience the Spirit of God and really experience him speaking back to you. I wish all of you could be prophets. We are witnessing in Exodus as a man who has come to learn what it means to have your own experience with God. And it's because God speaks to his people. He keeps speaking. And that pattern we see in Genesis and what we see that pattern in the cloud will continue throughout the canon of scripture all the way to Jesus. He will just keep speaking and speaking and speaking. And it says it beautifully in Hebrews 1 through 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. In John 1, 14, 
it reads the word, the voice of God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He pitched his tent, it says in the original language. He pitched his tent with us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. You see, God wanted us to hear him so badly. He embodied his voice in human form in the person of Jesus. So don't tell me God's not trying to speak to you or us. It might not be that God's not speaking. It might just be we're just not listening. The cloud dwelt among us through Jesus and spoke to us. This transcendent being who we call God has never stopped wanting to dwell amongst us. Praise God. Deeply desiring to communicate across dimensions with his kids, all in the name of love. So I love to end here with a great movie that I love called Interstellar by Christopher Nolan. Have you ever not seen it? Sorry for you, because spoiler alert, it's about to happen. In Christopher Nolan's film, Interstellar, we find, a, we find a former NASA engineer played by Matthew McConaughey, all right, all right, all right, who is called to a mission to save the world through unusual circumstances from a transcendent force that overcomes time and space to communicate across dimensions to his daughter named Murph. For a while, everyone in the family, including Matthew McConaughey's character, believes this transcendent force that is overcoming time and space to communicate across dimensions is just a fictitious ghost in his daughter Murph's imagination. Until Matthew's character encounters the communications himself, in his daughter's room, in Murph's room, through dust that perfectly lines up the needed communicated coordinates to a classified NASA facility that they will travel to and get the mission to save the world. All from the room of his daughter that he and everyone else thought was a fictitious ghost in Murph's imagination, which was so far from the truth though they thought. To make a long story short, because it's a long movie, the father goes on this interstellar travel mission to only be gone for days, but on Earth, it's 30 years. He is struck in the heart of the wrenching reality of his choice of sacrificing his presence in his kid's life to save the world. After two failed missions to planets that didn't turn out as they desired. So for a last ditch effort, the remaining two astronauts go separate ways. One to the last planet to save the world and the other, Matthew's character, goes into a black hole in hope that he can pass some information back to Earth. Instead, as he goes into this black hole, he finds himself in a fourth dimension realm where he can communicate to the third dimensional realm and specifically to his daughter in her room as a child. He realizes that he was his daughter's ghost all along in her room. At the same time, his now 37-year-old daughter, Murph, realizes it as well, that that was my dad in my room. He was my ghost. It was her father that was her ghost all the time, trying ferociously to communicate to her and get her attention. In the movie, you will see him at times hitting this, this bookshelf that's in between them and, and books are falling off. And then he gets more creative and starts trying to push certain books with the first letter of the author's name to try to send a message to her. He is ferociously trying to get 
her attention across dimensions to save the world. And the only reason Matthew knows that his daughter will soon hear him is because she still loves him. And that love has transcended time and space. And he knows it. And you know it while you watch it because she still wears the jacket that he had when he left as a 37-year-old daughter. He knows because he loves, she loves him. And he begins to communicate to her and the 37-year-old Murph hears him and saves the world. There's a powerful scene when the 40-year-old Matthew returns to earth and his daughter is now 80 years old on her deathbed. He walks into the room and she sobs deeply with joy to see her father face to face again, mouth to mouth. And he says, as in Matthew McConaughey's Matthew McConaughey's voice, I was your girl, I was your ghost, Murph. And the 80-year-old daughter responds, I knew you were. And no one believed me. Her dad responds, Why did you believe? And she says, because my daddy promised me. Doesn't our God say he will never leave us, nor forsake us, always hovering around us to protect us? She said, because my daddy promised me. The film explores the idea of love as a transcendent force that can overcome time and space and even communicate across dimensions. Does this sound familiar to you? The film illustrates the paradox of Cooper's mission, which is to save humanity by leaving his daughter behind. He becomes both her savior and her ghost as he sacrifices his presence in her life for a greater cause. And then think of Jesus in a short period of time on earth will save humanity by leaving us behind, still on earth, only to become our savior and our ghost. Come on, somebody. As Jesus sacrificed his physical presence on earth for the greater cause, for his presence as the spirit of God to not just hover over us, but to make his home in us and through us. Oh, I love me a good Christopher Nolan movie, especially Interstellar, but there's a greater story being told about an interstellar travel of a transcendent being of love overcoming time and space to communicate to you and me, his name is Jesus. Because I read it in my Bible that he has done that. And I see it in the face of Jesus that he did cross between dimensions to come talk to me. And I hear it in the still, quiet voice inside my heart, if I'm quiet enough. When I was at the, and I end with this, when I was um, at this gathering, I was getting coffee after in between sessions, um, and uh, the Lord spoke to me. He was talking to a kid that was volunteering to serve coffee. And um, if you're not familiar with this, this is 1 Corinthians 12, and the Lord gave me what is called in the gifts of the Spirit, a word of knowledge. And he told me about this young guy in the back, and he was like, he's a storyteller. And if you know um, a prophetic gift of the word of knowledge, it's to edify, encourage, and to bring consolation. And so after I got my coffee, it's a weird way how you, you know, it's always weird to do this stuff. And so I'm just like, hey, uh, hey, do you like stories? And the guy was like, like, like make videos and stuff. And the girl behind next to him said, oh, and looked at him. And usually when that happens, that means, okay, I think I nailed it. Uh, or God has nailed it as I transfer this information to him. And I said, um, well, I think... I just, I feel like you, you, you really like stories. Like, I don't know, I had a minor in film. Do you like stories? And you like make playing, making videos? He's like, yeah, I do, but, but is the motivation because he likes stories? He's like, yeah, man, I really do. Actually, all throughout high school and stuff, I made all these videos, and, and yeah, this is what I'm doing actually right now. It's very important right now in my life about this, and I've been thinking about it. I said, all right, that's, that's good. I just want to let you know, God told me to tell you you're a storyteller. 
and whatever rooms that you're about to walk into, be of courage. You are everything God has designed you to be. You are a storyteller. Go in there and be confident that your God sees you and he loves you and you're going to be, he's going to be with you. It just says, like, wow, I got my coffee went back in my chair. And then at the end of that day, it was like the last session, I'm walking up to the stairs and I see him and he said, hey, man, really, thank you for saying those words. He says, I actually, I just got a job with Nike in their marketing department and I have a very important meeting with their executives and I know that God made me this way and I was a little nervous, but after your word, I feel so encouraged that God is with me as I walk into there. That's what this world, this generation is looking for. It's us to go to that tent, to commune with the Spirit of God, to the voice of God, and on His behalf, change a life. Because who has been changed when we've been touched by the Spirit and voice of God? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that you are calling your people for such a time as this, of an awakening in our hearts, a revival in our hearts for the sake of this world. That if we will go to the tent, if we will awaken our soul, it will awaken a life, not a life, a people, not a people, a city, not a city, a nation, not a nation, the world. All because we've chosen to come and commune with you. Lord, as Moses says, let me know you as you know me. I pray for us today. Let us know you as you have known us. In Jesus' name, amen.